Welcome to another edition of the Get What It Podcast. I have a very special lady with me today. Uh, her name is Juliana Mayer. Did I, did I say it right? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Most people who listen to me on a regular basis know I screw up so, the name. So. <laughs> um, and she is coming from us all the way over from UK, right? Like yeah. What, what part? So we're based in Norwich, which is about two out, two hours outside of London. Oh, okay. So you are five hours ahead of us. Yeah. So this is like noon here, but drinking time there. <laughs> exactly. It's definitely beer o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes, that's what, yes, you should be like testing the beer. So. <laughs> um, I had to, I don't have a fancy office. I had to hide from my kids today. Um, normally I rent an office and, uh, I didn't ha I couldn't do it today. So, um, I'm in, I'm locked in my bedroom. I, I think during lockdown, we're all hiding from my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so, do you, so do you have kids? Yeah. So I've got two year old and, um, and yeah, so for the last few months we've all, so my husband works full time. I work full time and, and obviously my son's here full time and um, and at two you know he does need quite a lot of interaction so it has been a challenge to oh. make sure that he's getting the attention he needs and we're still giving work the attention work needs um so yeah it's been pre pretty relentless <laughs> two-year-old man yeah that's a handful that's a handful so. he's very sweet <laughs> <laughs> you say that now right when he becomes a teenager he might be like mm. <laughs> It's interesting. There's a, there's a phrase that my dad often uses that I really love, which is um, "small kids, small problems; big kids, big problems." Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that is true. Yes, your dad is right on. <laughs> All right. Well, we gotta like before the kid figure out where how. I mean, you have such an interesting background, and I was reading your bio, and I was like, oh, like. So I, but I don't want to say anything. I want you to tell your story. So, um, you don't have to start like when, when you came out of the womb, when you were two, but kind of your background, a lot of, um, I get a lot of people that inquire because UK education is different than what we have here. So, um, you guys, universities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, we, and I'll say a college and that's not the same. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. So start, I, I don't know, start when it became interesting. Okay. Well, um, yeah, so I guess, I, I mean, I might, maybe might even just say what I do now to kind of loop back to then everything sure. kind of feels like it's got context. So what I do now is I'm CEO and founder of a tech company called Superpass. And we're basically a SaaS business that makes out the box website and mobile apps for particularly businesses with content. So I always like to say in a sentence, we pretty much can give a business their own Netflix within about five minutes. So that's kind of just to kind of give the context. So oh. you know, people might have a podcast, hint, hint, um, you want to monetize their videos, fit, you know, whatever it might be, if it might be in health and fitness or e-learning through to music, TV and film, conferences, charities. I mean, we've got loads and loads of different clients. So it's really wonderful each day to, to know that we're really transforming the lives of all those entrepreneurs so I guess that's kind of where we're ending up and <laughs> it'd be good to um to start I guess from the from kind of how we how I got the, here and um, and I guess that kind of that entrepreneur theme definitely runs all the way through it because I feel like now what I'm doing is not entrepreneurs I'm really helping other entrepreneurs to be successful to transform their businesses to transition their businesses online and to, to, to really create additional revenue streams for them. So that's really cool for me because we get to work with these really inspiring entrepreneurs every day. Most of my day is uh, sales and client calls with entrepreneurs that have various challenges and we get to you know, help them through that. So that's really fun. Um, and then I guess going back to the beginning is I come from a family of entrepreneurs. So, um, and not just men entrepreneurs, but women entrepreneurs too. So both my grandmothers, they were both Business entrepreneur, business woman. Oh, really? My mum, she is. My aunts are. So I kind of come from this family where everyone 
was very entrepreneurial, but also, you know, men and women worked equally. And, and so I kind of worked, grew up not thinking that gender was like mattered or anything like that, because it was just about people doing a really good job. Um, and, you know, doing what they, they, they were good at and what they loved and then kind of entered the world of work. And then suddenly everyone's like, okay, so you're a woman in tech and, you know, like asking all these kind of questions. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I suppose I am. But why does that matter? <laughs> so I kind of like quite often if I get asked to speak on a panel about women in tech, I actually quite often say, well, actually, and actually on one panel, I actually got two guys from the audience to come sit on the panel because there was a panel of all women. And I was like, if we're going to have a conversation about that, this, it has to be, you know, bringing in everyone right. to the conversation. So, that, so I actually got off the stage and went and sat in the audience, let them <laughs> do their views, which was quite fun. Um, but yeah, so, um, I don't know where you want me to kind of dive in. Yeah, like you, so you, you, so your family, you kind of have this in your blood. Yeah, definitely. Right? I think the, the, the dinner table was where I learned about a lot about business because both my parents were working at one point in the same business, but then later on in two different businesses. And they would always chat about all the, you know, challenges and things. And that was basically dinner conversation. So I guess I kind of grew, grew up with all of that around me. Uh, and actually, the irony was, seeing how because I guess every entrepreneur knows is that you don't have a nine-to-five you pretty much will be working pretty much every waking hour probably and if you're not working you are thinking about it too um, and you're probably dreaming and sleeping thinking yes. about it too um, and <laughs> my parents doing this I thought oh man okay I don't know what I want to do when I grow up but I want to not be an entrepreneur <laughs> which was such an irony because then actually what I forgot about myself is that I really love solving problems. So I went and did um, engineering at university. So I did that at Oxford. And, um, and the reason I did engineering was because I love A, how things work, and I love science and maths, but I also love solving problems and making systems more efficient. So the irony is, is that I didn't become an entrepreneur because I wanted to start my own, own business. I became an entrepreneur because I wanted to solve a problem. Oh, so the second <laughs> part comes in when you went to the university. So, sorry, I missed that. The tech part, like the technical part, you did that when you went to the university? Yeah, so um, so my degree, although it was engineering, it wasn't actually software. It was actually, the, the, the course at Oxford, it's general, so we did civil engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. Like we, we did, it's a really intense course. <laughs> you did it's it all. Really, yeah, it's re it was really intense. Um, we did do a little bit of software, but like, you know, really only a small amount. And... Um, and yeah, so I didn't really do kind of software tech until later, but I've always been really into tech and computers and, you know, apps and how things work. And like when I was in a band, when we were 16, we recorded our own, we, we were in the news and stuff. Is it like a DIY, one of the first DIY bands when, you know, before kind of a lot of the, like now it's really easy to record an album. But oh, okay. We were doing like. I'm out there. <laughs> a band? Yeah, that, that's kind of where I started. <laughs> so you're a singer? Yeah, yeah. So that's, well, it's kind See, of... See, this is like the interesting part. Like, you were just going to kind of like breeze through that. <laughs> but... Yeah. It depends if you want us to be here all night or not. <laughs> How much of the story do you want? <laughs> so you're in a band in, in, as a teenager. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of, we, it, was, it was actually like a mini business. So there were four of us. And um, yeah, so this was when I was 16 and we were in a, a DIY band where we recorded the whole album ourselves on before the technology kind of made it really commonplace to do that. Um, and we did everything ourselves. So we built, you know, ha had a website in the days when like having little menu items that jumped around was pretty, like that was pretty high tech. Uh, you know, this is back in the 90s, just to, to kind of give the context. It's the kind of end of the 90s, but, but still the 90s. Um, and we, you know, we released the album ourselves. We ended up going on, um, so for those that don't know UK uh, television, it, Channel 4 is one of the four main TV channels or back then I mean it shows it was like terrestrial where you didn't have satellite <laughs> so they're like four main TV channels so we were on a program on channel four and we did all this various stuff and we kind of featured in the news as a DIY band but we were really doing it all ourselves um and and yeah we had hoodies and t-shirts and loads of merch and I mean, we, we basically you know we, we actually took before I went to university we took a year between school and university that a lot of that was actually paid for by 
you know, the money we made with the band because we just, I don't know, it was kind of, kind of cool, but we <laughs> never really kind of took it further than that. But that was really fun. And I learned a lot about running a business through that. And the four of us all had very different skills. So as well as obviously the music side of being the band, we, we did all the business side and, and all that, but each of us had different areas. Um, and it's cool, you know, the, 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 the band's gone on to do different things. So um, one, of, one of them works for the BBC as a sound production engineer. Another one um, is a, still, still in music. So she wrote one of One Direction's hits. Oh um, my God. Sharon. Um, and another one, um, he actually isn't kind of in that industry now, but he um, is, is an engineer, so he's an environmental engineer. Um, so it's kind of cool how we've all sort of gone up, like we le all learn a lot through that, that process. And, and yeah. So what kind of music? Was it like uh, oh, it was, rock? It was, rock? it was rock, yeah. It was, it was kind of rock, but with two female, very, like a lot of harmonies. Um, so it was kind of melodic. Um, but yeah, it does feel like another lifetime ago. <laughs> um, and then actually, and then I went to Oxford to do engineering, but then after that I actually went back into music. So then I did a bunch of solo stuff, started my own record label, really, you know, to release my own music. Um, and through that did some really random things like um, played at Glastonbury Festival, which is, um, for those that don't know, I guess it's probably, it's probably one of the most famous festivals in the world. Um, and played at the uh, UK Houses of Parliament. Um, I don't know, lots of, oh, I wrote uh, the um, Olympic... Um, the Olympic song for the so Norfolk's an area of, of England um, and I wrote when the Olympic torch in 2012 did its rounds of the UK when it came to Norfolk I wrote the official Olympic song for that county so when the torch came and was was lit in in, in the, the city of Norwich that everyone was singing my song it was pretty fun <laughs> oh my god that is so Cool. And random, right? <laughs> yes. Very <laughs> random. But that's so cool. So, like, do you have, like, a website? Like, what if people oh. want to go listen to your music now? Hmm. Um, well, I probably need to do a bit of updating. But, um, yes. Um, I can send you the link for the show notes. There we go. iTunes? iTunes? <laughs> yeah, there is some stuff on iTunes and Spotify and stuff. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm totally checking <laughs> out. But it's very, it's a very long time ago. The stuff I've, I've secretly done since then is, is way better, but it's all going to stay secret for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so I basically, cool. I basically write music for my son now. So, um, so yeah, the, most of the songwriting I've done recently has just been for him. <laughs> He's going to grow up and be like, my mom's a rock star. He sings along. This is really cool. I wrote a song in January and I just, you know, I just play it on it. He's got a little guitar lele. I don't know if you've seen them. They're kind of a mix between a, a ukulele and a guitar. Yeah. And I just play it along to It's not I just used to play it to him at bedtime. He sings along. He sings the chorus. It's really, <laughs> it's a really weird feeling for me, like having him sing along. It's like, how do you know the words? I mean, I guess it makes sense that I'm playing it to him, but it's just weird for me. <laughs> oh my God, that's so sweet. It's sweet. That's it's so sweet. Oh my god! So you're you write music? I, I I do, but it's in the past. I mean, honestly, the, the the last ten years I've been doing super fast, and it's all consuming. I work sixteen hour days. It you know it's it's lit. I eat, breathe, sleep it. Um, there isn't time. There isn't room. There isn't headspace for anything else. But actually, that creativity that I used to, because I'm a quite a creative person, and that creativity that I needed like for my own soul to like express there I, I don't actually need to express that at the moment because with Superpass I have to be so creative every day you know the stuff we're doing with the product is really innovative and disruptive the problems we solve for our clients I have to constantly be thinking out box and kind of matching things together and stuff so I feel that actually I get to express that creativity through the work that I do with Superpass Okay, so now we'll dive into Superpass. Okay. <laughs> so I guess give us, okay, well, before we start, how did you even like, I am amazed on just how people think of these things and then make them happen. So how did you like come up with this idea and then make it happen? Well, I guess it's useful that we've just talked about a bit of the backstory because it, it really comes out of that because I, when I was working as a, as a musician running my own label, um, I felt that there was a lot of things that we in the music industry were doing that was manual and that could be automated with the power of technology and, that, and very specifically the link between an artist and their super fans 
could actually be automated where the fans already know they want to listen to and buy everything that the artist releases and the artist really wants to then make music and then release it in a way that they can market it so that fans buy it. So actually, if you've already got a whole bunch of fans here that know they want to pay for everything you, you release and you've got artists here that actually don't want to be marketing stuff but actually want to just be creating, why not link them together with a micro subscription, you know, $1 a month or something like that. Um, and this was... This idea was a long time ago. So now subscription is mainstream. Everybody's doing it. It's really, really where, you know, everyone's going towards subscription. I mean, the stats are, are really interesting. So 76% of online purchases now are actually subscriptions rather than one-time purchases. So oh, really? you know, subscription is exploding, membership, subscription, all of that. I mean, and this is really the area that we specialize in. But when I had the idea, <laughs> 13 years ago, <laughs> oh God, it's a long time ago. You know, even things like Spotify were really, really new then, you know, this idea now that pe people have loads and loads of subscriptions coming out of their bank account every month. Back then, it was more like your electricity bill or something like that. It wasn't necessarily digital services. Um, but I thought that this was really a no-brainer, that this is where everything was going and, and what people should be doing. And I thought, it's so obvious someone's going to do it. So I actually waited a long time for someone else to do it. But I, I really wanted to use it for, for what I was doing, because I was a one-person business doing a hell of a lot of stuff. And I thought, if I could, if I, you know, I had, I had thousands of fans that were saying, when are you releasing the new music that you've been writing? And I was like, I'm too busy marketing the old album that I spent, you know, I invested a lot of money creating it, and it just seemed crazy. So I really wanted this to exist so that I could just make everything much more real-time. You know, then I could, I could write and record a song in a day, but then I wouldn't be able to release that for a year. So instead, I could write and release a song for a day, know that, that I'd already sold it, pre-sold it to, to fans, and that was really the thing that I really wanted to exist. So eventually after about three years of waiting for someone to do it, I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. Now, I was very naive. I, did, I, I, didn't, I think I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, at that stage, I didn't really know. I, don't, I mean, although I had an engineering degree, I didn't really know anything about tech. I certainly didn't know anyone in tech. Um, I'd very recently moved to the city of Norwich, so I didn't really know anyone in Norwich. Um, and I was really starting from ground zero. Um, but you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And I was very determined and I just decided I was going to make it happen. So, um, I actually started off setting up a network group, um, which is now, it's Sync Norwich. It's, it's like kind of Norwich's tech and startup community. Um, but initially started with 12 of us. It's got, I don't know, a couple of thousand members now, but it started off with 12 of us in a pub. And I basically wanted to find like a tech co-founder <laughs> to, to, to make this, this, this um, software with. And, and I did it actually my second, second meeting and met a wonderful person who, who came on board to, to, to do it with me. Um, but yeah, that, that community, it was, it was just the right sort of right timing because there was a really strong community here, but no one was connected and it was really bringing everyone together. Uh, and actually, yeah. most of the team that we've hired have come through that network and through that community and everybody knows each other and is really supportive. And since then there's a few more and um, more kind of specialists groups that have formed and um, but the whole community here in Norwich is so supportive there's a lot of people working in tech but it's nice that you know if so for example obviously in lockdown it's been really hard so some companies have had a lot of layoffs so then we you know had emails going around everybody knows each other saying oh you know here's here's the CVs of all the people I've just had to let go can you hire them so it's been really nice to be able to support each other in that way we had um i mean we're not we haven't been doing the layoffs i'm saying you know other businesses that right plus um, and the uh, like for example when i had um someone join the team from another city they moved here and then their partner i just sent their cv round to all the other business owners saying does anyone want to hire um you know this 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 lovely person and she got a job within a day because i'd sent round. you know so it's really nice to have that kind of community but um, I, I digress. I guess we're talking about Hasi. <laughs> we have the same thing um, here in Columbus. We're very lucky that we have a tight knit group of uh, yeah. IT. Yeah. So that's awesome that that. It makes, it makes a really big difference, actually. And I, I think it is so important. And the thing is, you can make tech from anywhere in the world. I, we have clients that we sell to all over the world. We've never met them in person. We do everything over Zoom. I mean, obviously, Zoom's very popular now, but we've been using Zoom for years. Um, we, yeah, I mean, we do all of our sales and all of our clients' success all through video calls because oh, so you're, all over the this world. Is, this is not new to you. <laughs> no, it isn't, but it's nice to see everyone so familiar with it now. <laughs> so, we're all advancing in our Zoom 
ability. It's great, it's great technology. And um, yeah, I think the first time I used it was a few years ago where someone else got me on a call with it. I mean, I guess this is the, the, the best kind of um, viral marketing, isn't it? And then it was, we, we'd been using various video conferencing software for years and it, this was by far, you know, hands down beat all of the others. And that was yeah. before they would got the funky features they've got now. That um, is true. So, uh, so yeah, I, I feel like I di digress. I, I, I feel like I want to make this story a bit shorter. But, <laughs> so, so skipping over quite a lot of the detail, you know, starting from really not knowing anything, um, ended up kind of bo basically bootstrapping for, so the first three years was hard. I was basically bootstrapping. I had no money. I didn't, I didn't know anyone. I had no money. Um, you know, we were literally doing it from, from zero and um, really just went out and just introduced myself to people and built up a network by pretty much going to conferences and going up to whoever it was I wanted to speak to and saying, hi, I'm Juliana. <laughs> and it, it, it actually worked. I mean, you know, I've ended up with a network of some of the top leaders in the world. For a time we had Jeremy Silver, our chairman, who's one of the top thought leaders in the world in this space. And um, so he um, was CEO of Sibelius until that sold. To, to, so Sibelius is the world's leading composing software. He, um, he grew that and then that sold to um, Avid. He also was um, chairman of Music Metric that sold to Apple. He's had oh. loads of success in that. And he's currently CEO of, Di of Digital Catapult, which is the UK government's digital program. So he's, um, uh, he's amazing. And he was our chairman for, for a while. And um, sadly, he had to leave because he got the job as CEO of Digital Catapult. Um, but we, I mean, we've got this wonderful network of, of people that have helped us all along the way. Our current chairman is, is Clive Gardner, and he's actually been helping us almost from day one. Um, and he, also an incredible background in tech and music and retail. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, we're, we're phenomenally lucky to have um, these brilliant people kind of on our advisory board and supporting us um, and just just helping out. Um, and yeah, and, and that basically came from me literally going up to people saying, you don't know me, but here I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I and, love it. <laughs> and yeah, and I, we didn't have any money, so I was just supporting myself by teaching cello in the evenings. I had all these kind of cello students that used to come around my house in the evenings and I'd do all of those and then in the day be like dress, you know, kind of frantically trying to, you know, <laughs> build some technology and get some, get some people using it. Um, and then after about three years, things kind of changed because then we, we, I mean, we had a beta, we had some really good clients using it and then we did quite well um, in a South by Southwest startup competition um, and then we started being able to raise investment. So we, I mean, the raising investment, anyway, I mean, that's a, probably another story for another time. But, <laughs> and obviously raising investment as a start. I mean, at that point we were music tech. I mean, now we don't do music. Well, we, we don't just do music now. We do lots of other things too. But um, investors in music, I think, is probably even harder to get investment than, than most tech startups. But we managed to get investment. And it was really crazy because um, when we actually managed to raise, we had a queue of investors literally queuing up to hand me their business card after we've already raised all the money. <laughs> um, I turned up at an angel event saying, actually, um, I don't really need to be here today because we've, we've actually just raised all the money we needed today, this morning. Um, but I'm going to tell you, I'm here anyway. I've traveled all the way to Cambridge. I'm going to tell you about what we're doing. And we literally had a queue of angel investors handing me business cards with like, you know, amounts scrolled on the back of their business card saying, make, make room for me. Oh my God, that, <laughs> that is was, awesome. That really nice. And, um, and yeah, and then that kind of changed things because then we could actually hire a team and, and grow. And that kind of really went into chapter two. I feel like there've been three chapters of super fast. So chapter one was bootstrapping with literally nothing. Chapter two was we raised some money and we, we basically then became the fair trade streaming the fair trade streaming app for music where an um, artist could actually earn up to hundred percent of their revenue from streaming. They could each have their own subscription channel. So the fans that were subscribing to them could each actually know their money was going direct to that artist. So it was a really different model for the music industry. And we worked with quite a, um, a lot of the big, um, big music companies with that. And, um, but then what started to happen is we actually found that we were getting approached by all sorts of other businesses like um, in TV and film and, um, really just all kinds of places that had content and actually wanted to monetize it. And one of our first outside of music was um, a celebrity called Matt Hayes. He's actually um, a, one of the world's top fishing celebrities. So he's got loads of TV series on Discovery Channel and things like that. And he came and said, you know, I have all these DVDs. I need to somehow, you know, people don't buy DVDs anymore. People don't even have DVD players, but this is the only way for my fans to buy my content. The other 
place that they can watch it is, is, is reruns on Discovery Channel or bootlegs on YouTube where I'm not getting any money for it. Right. So he basically wanted his own mini Netflix, which was then where the fans could pay 20 bucks a year to then access all of his you know, series and, and back catalogue of films and also fund him to make future films because obviously the way that funding in broadcasting, it's really changed in recent years. Um, and he did, you know, he's got a really, really, I mean, fishing fans who knew are really, really fanatical. So, you know, they really love what he does and he's got a really good rapport with them. So this was a great opportunity really for him to have his own membership and his own Netflix all tied into one. Um, and that really opened up our eyes to, well, we kind of always thought it could be used for other things, but it, it kind of made it more instant. We were like, okay, well, let's do it for him. And that went really well. And then I did a talk at a tech conference where I then had some people saying, I've, I've got this course, I sell into universities, and I really need an app to do that. Um, and that was our first e-learning client. Um, and it's really grown since then. And then we, we really started investing more in that side of the technology. And that's when we then looked at white label. So up till that point, Superpass was a platform with different channels for, you know, each person had, um, and this was before Patreon as well. So when Patreon came along- I was along, gonna say like, this, Patreon, I've heard of Patreon. Yeah. So we were doing this before Patreon. And when they came along, I, I mean, I, I, I think they've executed really well. I think they're a really great team and a really great product. Um, and it was really nice to see that. And then I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, we don't have to do this bit because actually Patreon were doing, now doing that really well. And the opportunity then really was in actually white labeling it because actually that's what a lot of the bigger celebrities and brands actually wanted was they, yes, they want to be able to monetize their content and have their own subscription, but they really want to do it on their own website and in their own app. And we, there was a way for us to quite easily um, do that with our technology. So that's really where we went next. And that's really what the product is now. So basically, out, you know, as I said at the, at the start, kind of within five minutes, you can have your own Netflix or Spotify or, you know, if you're a podcaster or whatever it is, if you've got audio, video, or, and even articles or blogs, you can have all your content together. You can monetize it in a way that you're getting 100%. I mean, even Patreon stuff, you're still getting a rev share. You're still losing, um, you know, the amount that, patron have to pay in taxes and stuff you're still losing all of that with this you literally get 100 percent of everything all the money goes directly to you and we're literally just powering the tech underneath it all and if you're doing video courses or you're um really you know any kind of content and actually quite a lot of our, our clients now are actually podcasters who aren't just podcasters they also have a video course they also sell consultancy they also want to do live webinars they want to do all these different things and at the moment the call to action you know you, it, you say um, you know, listen to my podcast, then you're saying, okay, go to my show notes. And in the show notes, you're saying, okay, go to my sponsors or my, or my website. And then at the website, you're trying to get them to contact you to then buy your consultancy or like whatever right. it is. Whereas actually with what we can do is the call to action on the podcast can be download my app. And then with the app, you're then able to read all the show notes. You can make comments and join the community for a lot of podcasters, they are being supported on Patreon, but instead of it being fragmented, you could actually then say, okay, well, in the app, you can support me, but then you know you're getting 100%, not the, you know, losing the cut, um, and everything's directly there. And then you've also got your videos. If you are doing a podcast where actually you've got videos too, you can have that there. Or if you're then wanting to offer some ad-free podcasts or some exclusive episodes or, you know, whatever it is, it can all be done within our tech so that everything's in one place. Do people like put um, ads? Like so Because the, what uh, clients get when they use our, us for their website and app is that they're really offering their customers a premium service where, I mean, you, they, I mean some do not use the, the paywall, so they'll actually just use it as an email gateway to collect email addresses or, or even just as a, a shop window for, as their website for their content. But in most cases, if they are using the paywall, then, then their customers are, are paying, so they don't want ads, because obviously most of what you're paying for is the fact it's a kind of ad-free environment. So, so no, we actually don't support ads at the moment because we find that's not something that our customers want. It comes up occasionally, but um, we just felt that, you know, doing the experience as it currently is feels like a really pure experience. Okay, yeah. I mean, most people will, if you're playing a game, on your phone, you'll pay for that premium, like 99 cents or whatever, ads, exactly. just so you don't have to have the ads. <laughs> it's, it's the same with, with audio and video content. You know, a lot of what YouTube's subscription now is about is about people actually being able to watch YouTube without the ads. 
Um, so, you know, I think people actually really value their time more than a few bucks. So actually, if there's something that you are spending a lot of time on, you don't want to be interrupted by ads. You don't want to be wasting your, you know, minutes of your life is probably the most precious thing you have. So actually, you know, pay, especially if the subscription is only $2 a month, then it's, you know, it's kind of, it's almost a no brainer. I mean, that's less than a cup of coffee. Right. To, and, and also, you know, that you're supporting the work that, and I think that's a lot of the, the ethos behind you know, a lot of people want to support the creators that they love. And actually one of the musicians that we work with is Imogen Heap, who, um, you know, world renowned Grammy award winning artist. She's got a fan base where actually a lot of them chose to pay more. So she set the subscription as a couple of, couple of dollars a month and loads, I think, um, oh gosh, I can't remember, that's off my head now, but more than 20% of the fans were paying like more than double that, not getting anything extra, but just because they really want to give her money to make more of the art that they love. Right. Um, and uh, and yeah, and I think that's a really big thing. And that, I mean, that's basically what happens on Patreon, isn't it? A lot of those, a lot of those fans aren't necessarily. I mean, some of them are getting extra things, but for a lot of them, then you know, they're supporting the podcaster where the podcast is already really available. But they're actually wanting to support, you know, the the creators. So that's yeah. super cool. Wow. <laughs> of course, now, like I'm like, huh. Juliana and I will be speaking. What I love actually about what we do is because it's so universally applicable and it's really for any business with content, which these days, given how important content is, that's almost every business. And wherever I go, whether I'm, you know, have a chat with someone at, at a dinner or talk on a panel at a conference or whatever it is, I'll then have a whole bunch of people coming up to me saying, gosh, actually, we really need this or I know someone that needs this. And it kind of feels like, it's something people need, but don't necessarily know they can have. So that's for us as a business, that's our next marketing challenge is it's something that everybody could really benefit from, but not everybody knows that it's a pain point. Once they hear about it, they're like, oh yeah, that's a no brainer. Oh yeah, we definitely need right. it. But they're not like necessarily actively looking for it because they're busy, because maybe they've already got a website. Yes, maybe it's clunky and you know, not really up to date, but actually it does the job and they know they want to, they know they want to update it, but it's going to take time and money and everybody's busy. Whereas actually what we do, it's, it's probably cheaper than the solution they're currently on. It's probably quicker to, to do than any, you know, any of the other things. I mean, even if you look at the, cause so we're definitely not a website builder. And, um, you know, if you look at Wix and WordPress and stuff like that, um, people can use us instead of that, but we're not like that in that you can't come there and, customize everything and I mean you know we're not trying to do everything and be everything but actually that's one of our strengths because for a lot of people that use WordPress or Wix they like they actually hire a web designer to then go and build it for them because it's quite complicated especially if you've actually got tons of content you did exactly <laughs> perfect perfect yourself. I mean you, you're not alone this is what I you know a lot of people do because it is complicated people are busy you probably value your time more than the amount of time you have to take to learn it and um, and actually what we offer is that the website part of what we do is so out of the box. It's like, for example, with Facebook, you can't like choose how the layout is on the page. So we're in the same, the same, you know, it's a framework, but you can obviously customize color and all your images and your branding. And so you can really still make it look and feel like yours, but you're not having to worry about now. I wonder what the best way to navigate around to get to a video is. We've figured that out. We've got, you know, we've got um, data across all of our clients and their users of what works and what hasn't. We've been doing it for 10 years and we're constantly iterating and optimizing that experience. So why should someone who doesn't know anything or, or, or you know, that's not their, the, the main core of their business have to figure that out? We've figured that out for them. They can come to us and for as little as, you know, 20 bucks a month, they can have that already with payment ready, all their content. We do all the hosting. I mean, it just makes it really, really easy. For yeah. Everyone. I will tell you, yes, I, um, Upwork, you know, Upwork. Yes, I, yeah. yep, I went to Upwork and I was like, this is not my forte. Who can help me? And yeah. Great. We use Upwork actually. It's, it's a really great way to get, to get experts to do stuff and, 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 you know, quite an affordable way to do it as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, if, if you'd known about us, you could have come to us we, and within a week you could have had not only your own beautiful website, but you could have had your own mobile apps in, in the Apple and, and Google Play Store. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, you still can. We don't. I'm going, I know. We'll be talking <laughs> after this. 
<laughs> you just didn't realize that that was about to happen was, okay, now how do I? <laughs> Fine with me. I mean, this is, it, it's funny actually, because um, we, we get all kinds of uh, inbound leads coming in from very different market verticals. Um, and I really love those, and you know what I said about earlier about the creativity not being missing from life, because I love those conversations because almost every client call or, or sales call that I have, their businesses have different problems, but there's so many common themes. So even if someone, you know, you've got a client over here that's in e-learning and you've got another one over here that's in fitness and another one over here running a charity, actually a lot of the challenges that they have are the same challenges. And especially around digital and content and how to drive a subscription and how to monetize it and all of those things. Actually, there's so, so much commonality and we see that every day and we see what works for people and what doesn't. And also, I think the other thing, and this, this often comes out as, as advice in those calls, is the other thing people often try to do is they think they need something to be perfect. They think that they can't, for example, let's take a course. It's, a, it's, it's an easy example. If someone wants to make an online course, they think they need to make all of the course up front, make it perfect before they ever even sell to one person. But actually, quite a lot of the time, if you kind of, the best way to, 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 to make something and improve something is actually to get real feedback from real customers. So actually you can, there's loads of things, you can pre-sell the course before you've even made it. You can make the first module, get people learning that, and then through the feedback of that, then make the other modules. Like there's so many different stuff. For a lot of people, you can even just, you can even do something like this. Like we're, we're sat here on a Zoom call. You could literally make your course using Zoom to record. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> potentially, um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're someone who's already doing kind of one-to-one -one sessions or something, then obviously with permission, you could kind of actually make that consultancy the beginning of your course. And then you could get the feedback from people of actually what's useful to them. And then you can go and then make the kind of higher production videos but for people to think okay I need everything to be completely set out at the beginning and everything to be high high production the editing of um, you know just to edit an episode can take absolutely ages if you're doing it that way whereas instead you could be you know every hour could be a, a, another thing and if people know that that's the nature of what they're buying then you know you can, you can say this is a beta of the course I'm giving you 50% discount on it to, to give me your feedback um, and then people can actually already start to get it off the ground you learn so much more and then when you actually come to make the expensive time consuming high production stuff you've learned so much rather than doing that up front never worst never ever getting off the ground and um, right. there was an amazing i love simon sinek i'm a big fan of his and he told a really interesting story the other day and um, where he was talking about you're on an island with loads of sharks and crocodiles around the island and, and you want to get to the shore and there's loads of resources on the island you've got wood and trees and everything and you want to get across so you start building a bridge and you build the bridge and then you're halfway on the bridge and you go well oh, actually it's a bit low I think I want to build a higher bridge so you chop down some more trees and you build the higher bridge and you get about halfway across the bay and you're like oh actually I, I want to build a wider bridge so then you go and you build your third bridge and, and you're halfway building your nice high wide bridge and you realize you've run out of resources and this is what a lot of people do is they kind of think it has to be perfect and instead they end up spending all their time and all their money and all their resources not actually getting anywhere so instead build the imperfect bridge get to the, your destination and then figure out what you want to do next but follow through you know really just get something out there and that, that that's a lot of I think we definitely see that across the clients that we work with that people are trying to be perfect whereas actually just keeping momentum and get you know getting out there. I love the 80 20 rule you know that you can do 80 percent achieve 80 percent of the stuff with 20 percent of the time right and that, that final 20 percent of getting it perfect will take another 80 percent of effort yes yeah. that's very good advice because that's true a lot of people they give up on it because it's not perfect and they think it has to be it's tempting you know I, I by nature I'm a perfectionist and I actually had to really really learn not to do that and I, I i actually think the early days of superfast when i when i was bootstrapping pretty much on my own for three years trying to do everything i had to learn the 80 20 rule because you know I, I i was literally wearing i was doing six people's jobs i was wearing so many different hats and i couldn't do any of it properly but by just you know a certain amount is, is good enough 
that then meant that we've now got to where we are now. Um, but it was, it was something I had to learn. It was actually something I had, and I still sometimes have to do it. Like there's some things you do still need to be perfect. Like, you know, if you're filling out a tax return or something, obviously you really need to make sure it's right. But you know, if you're, I don't know, writing, writing a blog post or something, you know, it gets to the certain point where you could keep editing it forever, but actually just getting it out there and writing the next one is probably more important. Right. Yes, definitely. So what? Okay. So you're so busy all day long. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you, I mean, like, come on, you got to have some fun. Um, <laughs> well, my, my son is, is a lot of fun. Um, I think, I mean, you know, particularly now that we've been in lockdown for a few months, um, it's just really challenging at home. You know, we're doing full-time work, full-time childcare. There, there really isn't a lot of time for, for anything else. Um, but I love being outside. I love the outdoors. I, you know, I think that's really, really important. So, um, I definitely try and get in some fresh air and exercise a few times a week. Um, and try and make the rest of the team do it too. Um, you know, I'm always like, have you been outside yet today? <laughs> no, it's beautiful, sunny. You can work later. Do it. Just go outside right now. <laughs> so I think, you know, that work-life balance is really, really important for everyone else. I'm not too good at it. Um, <laughs> um, what fun things. I, saw, I, I joined the D&D group recently. That was quite, that's been quite fun. The what? Uh, sorry, Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Oh, you know, in lockdown, you can't, literally can't go anywhere, see anyone. So we're d we're doing it on Zoom, and it's quite fun. It's once a week, um, with actually with um, some uh, the local developer community. Oh, so that's fun. Been, it's been really fun, actually. So, have you been has have your industry been hit at all with this whole COVID craziness? I I think realistically, every industry has been hit. I mean, we've certainly seen it with businesses we know that have had you know, big, big job cuts and things like that. Um, for us, what's happened actually is we've been busier than ever because actually a lot of businesses are trying to transition online. So for example, you know, a gym instructor who used to do all, um, like a yoga instructor who used to do all their classes face to face. Now suddenly they're having to do it on zoom, but actually managing how they get the zoom links out to everyone is a bunch of emails. Maybe people want to watch back the recording afterwards. That's a bunch more emails and weird links and downloads. And um, they want to collect some payments and they're having to set up PayPal over there. So all of that stuff we actually can solve, you know, by just, they literally just have their, their website or app that all of that can be managed in it. And then people literally just need to create their login, but then all of the content is then there in that area. And we have a really cool feature, which is, um, where they can actually have that in a private space as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be public to, to others. So a class, a cohort who um, are just attending that intimate class and the videos are intimate, let's say postnatal mums, they're not going to want that to be on the internet, but right. it might be a video just for all the people in that particular class and the Zoom might in include that kind of co collaboration between all the mums in the class. Um, and then that can actually go into a private space in the app or, or website that only they can access with a special access code. So there's some really cool new features we've brought out specifically to cater for that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, so we've just been busier than ever because we've got all those kind of business, physical business trying to transition online. Then we've got um, clients, existing clients actually wanting to use it much more than ever before because suddenly all these other activities they were doing in their business that were distraction in the physical world that they now can't do. So now they're like, oh right, I really need to do more with this. So we've seen that. Um, so some of our clients are doing a lot of deals. So, um, for example, a fitness client has been doing a lot of deals with gyms where all those gym memberships can now have access to all of their streaming content. Oh. So we built some extra stuff into the system to enable them to do B2B licensing deals. Um, so, yeah, lot, lot, it, we've just been busier than ever, um, which is, I guess, good for us, but obviously bad given the circumstances. Um, but, yeah, it's... Yeah, I think, I mean, I think everybody's been hit by it in different ways. Um, and certainly the emotional uh, context is really, really different. And, um, you know, people are going through all kinds of different hardships. Yeah, it's been, yes, up and down roller coaster. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've said to multiple people, like, we're like overly tired children right now. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a tiredness that comes with this, whether it's the low-lying stress and worry or something about not actually you know interacting anywhere other than on a screen there's all kinds of reasons right um, and of course there's you know 
I mean, I, 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 I had a friend who died um, of COVID. She was oh, only 35. Oh, she didn't God. know she had underlying health conditions. Um, you know, and, and I know lots of people that are going through all that kind of stuff. So of course we're all dealing with that. And the other thing that's definitely, uh, you know, happening at the moment is normally in life, people go through hard times and, and grief and different things. And they have a network of people that they can turn to support them, family, friends. Um, but at the moment, everyone is going through that. Everyone's going through their own stress. So you turn to your support network, but everyone is stressed. <laughs> everyone emotionally overloaded. Um, so actually that kind of adds to it as well. It does. Yeah. It definitely does. Yeah. yeah. Well, are you guys still locked down or can you go out? So we're technically lockdown easing, which means that a lot of things are opening up, oh. but with social distancing, okay, the so message we're... is still kind of, if you can work from home, do. And mm -hmm. um, as a team, we actually have, we've just uh, closed our office uh, uh, for good for the, for the moment. So all the team has decided that for the next six to 12 months, we all want to continue to work remotely. When things get safer, we'll still probably meet up, spend Fridays together or something like that. Um, but yeah, actually, we're working really effectively remotely. Um, everyone's really enjoying being able to work from home. Um, we're very tight-knit team. We're very collaborative. Um, so, like, for example, this morning, we had a, a team-wide team where we were actually designing a whole new part of the system. I was a bit nervous. We've done, we've done a lot of stuff remotely, but I was a bit nervous about that because normally those kind of days, they, they don't happen that, very, that often, but they're very, very creative and collaborative. And, you know, it's the sort of ones where you get out a big whiteboard across the right. hall and everyone scribbles around and your breakout sessions. And, um, and you, there's just really energizing atmosphere. And I kind of thought, oh, how... I kind of felt a bit like I was going to meet a bit with my hands tied behind my back. Like, how can we express, get that same expression out? Um, but actually, it worked brilliantly. I feel like we got all of the same creativity out as we normally do. Everyone felt very included. We have a new member of the team who's literally just joined. This was his first meeting with the team. And the first 10, 15 minutes of the meeting was actually just social, just introducing everyone, catching up, making him feel really welcome. So we, we do actually do a lot of social stuff on uh, Zoom as well. So we'll have two, three or four sessions a week where it's uh, – coffee sessions and then a, a, a beer, a Friday beers as well, where we, do, we don't talk about work, we talk about life and we just support each other. And I think making that as a business, making the time to do that is really, really valuable for, for the whole team. And I think businesses that think they don't, can't, you know, can't afford business time to, to do that. Right. Actually, I, I think they're, they're really, you know, I would really, really strongly recommend that because we, we really, really support each other in a personal and social um, aspects as well. And I think during this period, different people have uh, got the lockdown blues at different times and needed different support at different times. And without those sessions, you don't pick up on it. If you turn up to a work meeting, you don't notice that because people are being professional and you know talking about what they need to get on with. But when you have those kind of chats, people can really say, you know, maybe they're just thinking about, I don't know, the sky or the... <laughs> something they read on the news or whatever it is, but those things come out and then you can pick up on actually how people are really feeling. Um, or, or if people aren't turning up a lot, then you kind of think, oh, maybe I should give them a call and see how they're doing. So we've been very, very close to each other and really supporting each other. And I definitely recommend that because it's made a huge difference. That's and great. Then, how many people are on your team? 14 of us. So you're like a still startup size. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're small, but I actually really like that size. We have at different times kind of grown a bit bigger than that. And I've actually kind of kept scaling it back to this size because it kind of feels like it's that critical turning point where when you get bigger than that, you start to have, you, you actually lose a lot of things. So if we can keep it to this size, then actually that, I mean, obviously not necessarily always, but as long as we can, I actually see that as a benefit. Um, we do a lot of, in, in terms of the sales and things like that, we actually do a lot of our sales with uh, affiliates and resellers and things like that so that we don't actually necessarily need to like suddenly have a, a, you know, a massive sales team. Our sales team is pretty small, but we're managing all of these other kind of people out there that are selling on our behalf because actually our product, what it, how it really works is that it solves a problem that a lot of people are having, but often... And um, our affiliate stuff are, often have their own clients who have those problems and then they can actually sell it to them, make, make money out of it through something. You know, we've got people that are earning hundreds a month from literally an email intro 
it took them one minute to make that intro. Now they're earning recurring revenue of several hundred a month from, 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 from an email intro. So, you know, right. and I guess that's another nice money earner for anyone out there that feels they've got clients or a network that could use what we're doing. That's, oh, yeah, I didn't think about the affiliations that you could work through. So, yes. Oh, man, girl, you're just going to take over the world. I love it. That's, that's the plan. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm joking about it. I, I'm serious. Like, that's, that's our ambition is we want to be the platform people come to to have their own content website and mobile apps. Okay, so <laughs> since you said that, what is, what's the website? So, basically, our product um, is where the, our clients have a white label website, iOS app, and Android app. So it's theirs, it's on their URL, it's all their own branding. We're, we're white label, so we're, you know, in the background. Nobody knows that that website is a superpass website. So is and, it superpass.com? Like how would, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, like... Oh, our website. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of important to share. So, um, yeah, it's literally superpass.com, and it's super with an A, so that sometimes um, catches people out. So, yes, S-U-P-A-P-A-S-S.com. Um, and it's really easy to sign up there or if anyone wants to have a call with us, they can just, you know, request a call. So, uh, so yeah, and it's. Okay. And then they can, week, someone can have their own mobile apps. And, <laughs> and they can um, reach out to you. Like I have um, a lot of people that I know that um, do the content, like the courses and that kind of stuff. So I, I'm going to pass that along and be like, you should just do this. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be amazing. Thank you. <laughs> this would be a lot easier for you. <laughs> so, but, um, all right. So, um, S U P A P A S S dot com. Mm -hmm. Right. Anything else? Like what else do you want to promote out there? Um, well, I, 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 I guess I'm really focused on that. <laughs> like that's, it's so, it's so all encompassing what, what we do and, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just feel like particularly at the moment, so many businesses are struggling because of the pandemic and so many businesses are trying to figure out, you know, what's my business going to be doing 12 months from now. And what I would say to businesses out there or anybody listening, it doesn't have to be businesses. Maybe you're just a, a creator, not just a creator, creators are amazing, but you know, maybe you're a creator, maybe you're running a business or, or whatever it is you're doing. If you're not, already thinking about subscription, I would say it's something to definitely start paying attention to because it's where everything's going. Um, and it's really, really easy to do these days, um, especially with a platform like ours, but there's lots of other options out there too. Um, and also with content, the, the challenge with content is that people seem to, you know, for, for end users, they're used to using things like Netflix or Spotify or all these things that are beautiful, seamless intuitive and then if you're doing your own website for your content then people will come there and a lot of the time is then clunky and difficult to navigate around and end users are really I guess really spoiled now with this amazing technology and what I feel really excited about is that actually we level that playing field we say well why shouldn't you have the same technology that Netflix is offering and that's really what we're aspiring to be able to give to content makers is to be able to have that experience, that user experience for their customers, but without having to build it from scratch or pay a lot for it or have someone else's brand on there. So it's not, you know, it's not a Facebook group or YouTube channel or even a, a, a Patreon. It's your brand. They're coming to your ecosystem. You own the email addresses, you own the data, you get hundred percent of the revenue. You know, it really is, for a lot of our clients, they say it's a game changer for them because it gives them everything they need, but without the, the cost and without the, the complication and the time that they need to invest. So I do feel that I'm really excited because it, I don't think there is anyone else out there quite solving that problem. There's lots of peripherals and, you know, if you're just a podcast or just making courses, there are options out there. But if you're making multiple types of content, video and audio and having a blog or articles, there isn't really anyone that's solving that. Right. Definitely. <laughs> I'm going to be sending get with it stuff to you now. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. That'd be awesome. 
<laughs> so on your next your next episode you'll say your call to action will be download my new app download my new app um, <laughs> But I will say, um, so um, we are having our virtual conference on um, September 29th, 30th, and October 1st. I do a little promoting here. So um, I, I will send over the information and you can blast it because everybody, um, we are hoping to get a lot of international. Um, I know it's going to be Eastern Standard Time, but hopefully that, um, well, I mean, for you, it was kind of af later afternoon, evening, so. Yeah, it's, it's a good time to join a conference. We quite, yeah. quite often join conferences on the East Coast. So, yeah, that's um, a good time. I know when you do a virtual conference, although we will have it accessible um, 24 hours, so. For I'm really interested. What tech are you using for the virtual con conference? So this is so funny. So I just signed the contract for Hex Affair. Okay, cool. Do you know them? I don't know, but I'll definitely be Googling it in a minute. <laughs> so they create this like, kind of like this, like you, game changing. Um, you're an avatar and you're walking through the booths because we are nonprofits, so we have sponsors and um, a lot of video interaction um, with avatar to avatar kind of thing. and. Um, speakers yes so um they i did a lot of research on this as far as um when i started to first look at it the some of these platforms were like two hundred thousand dollars and we're like yeah we have like five because <laughs> we're nonprofits. so every year you know we just have enough to yeah. book for the local venues but now that we have four chapters we're launching Pittsburgh this week. Um, it's, you know, it's not like we're rolling in money. So um, I, had, I was like, yeah, this is way out of our league. And there weren't things I could do. So like on the back end, I have to be able to upload the content and be able to do all that. And um, yeah, some of that stuff I just couldn't. I, way above my head <laughs> way above my head so user experience from that kind of thing is so important isn't it making it really intuitive yeah and we in one thing that was really important for me was um the user experience so at the get wetted conferences there's like this energy and women empowering and supporting other women and coming together and being just together and um my fear is the 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 lack of like you said with the creativity yeah. that you were you know worried about that that's kind of kind of my stress is making sure i think it's, it's a new world now and i think that actually people will increasingly find that these things are possible online i went i went oh my gosh i went to this amazing party Online, it was oh, between, online. <laughs> it was 12, yeah, it was a twelve-hour party. A twelve-hour party. And yeah, it was it was incredible. I've been to three of them now. They're amazing, and it's all these creators from all over the world that have all these different breakout rooms, doing different things. Um, and and honestly, this party, I found everything I would normally find at a normal party. So there was random conversations with groups, random conversations with individuals. And um, there was even a toilet queue where, you know, you end up just like, I don't know, there's a certain kind of conversation you end up having in toilet queue. We even had like that as a, as a room. Um, there was entertainment. There's a live jazz band. There were DJs. There was people painting to, there was live music, people painting to it in a, in a group together, you know, but this is all like remotely, but it was absolutely phenomenal. And the atmosphere, I came away, from, you know, people obviously drinking or, or whatever they're doing. Right. Um, and then we had, like the midnight ritual where everyone got to like share something emotional or something meaningful to them. And there was some poetry and a bit of a song and there was karaoke. And one of the things, I mean, honestly, you wouldn't believe the stuff that was going on. Um, and I came away from it feeling like all the things that I get from a party, I felt like I came away from it getting it. I had interacted with people. I had met new people. I had had meaningful 
the conversation that I had really, really, you know, the kind of conversation you're like, how do I politely get out of this? <laughs> um, I had lots of fun and it was great. And then actually, because we're in the UK, so I, I stayed, it started at 8 p.m. here and went, I stayed till about one in the morning. And then when I woke up about seven, there was still an hour left of it because in um, on the, the West Coast, they were still, they were going till till midnight there so they, they were still a DJ and stuff and I was literally hanging the washing at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning um, still listening to the DJ at this live party <laughs> it's really random and um, and yeah and it's just it's, it, I, I find it really interesting the only thing missing from it was basically VR like you know right you got everything you you would have I mean obviously there is still I mean one of the people said on it that they've got everything from it apart from hugging people you know I think there's something from physical touch that yeah. is different that you kind of can't replicate but maybe all the other things maybe a pay, it's kind of the 80 20 thing isn't it it's a paler version of it but compared to literally sitting in a room on your own it is actually really fulfilling um so you know with the conference i think you know i think you probably could actually get quite a lot of that atmosphere just from people coming along passionate with their you know the outcomes that they want and the people they want to meet i went to a conference recently where there was one-to-one -one networking with random people and I did make, I got three sales calls out of, you know, I had, I had four conversations and I got three sales calls out of it. So when I go to a conference, often it is about expanding my network and meeting people. And I got That's that out of this want. conference. And, and there were some people there that I already know. So I reconnected with them. Hey, how are you? How are you finding things? And whilst the talks were going on, they had an expo where they showcased the sponsors. It was amazing seeing all of this, you know, online. Yes. So this, well, we're going to try to pull it off. I think it'll be brilliant. So yes, we're hoping. Um, and then after the event, you could have an app for it where you put all the content after the event for people to come to. They can still continue to comment, and then all through. Oh yeah, the you year, and I, we're going to go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, that's the we provide for conferences. <laughs> is, is you know, so so the, the conference stuff we typically provide is not for the actual conference day, but it's for what the conference does all the rest of the year round, where they're really because because the thing is with conferences typically you spend so much time building up all that work towards one day right and then the rest of the year it's like zero whereas actually what we can do is we can help you to create that energy and community all the year round you continuing for that content to actually keep living as well um, and in some cases also create a revenue stream all the year round so yeah we do quarterly events and um i think sometimes after the conference, it's like this, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then kind of like a, and we have to rebuild that excitement all over again every year. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Plus app for the I need to get with it app. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can have, and the things you can have it all together. You can have the podcast in there and you can have the conference thing. And all of these can be different products within the same app. So if you've got a user that, is only interested in this one area over here, they could just be involved with that. But if you want to then upsell the other bits to them, they're in the app, they're getting the push notifications, you're constantly in, you know, in their mind, reminding them that you're there. And so it's a great way to, to actually have a funnel to the other parts of your business as well. Yeah, that definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, well, we'll be talking about Get Water. Right, done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, I don't, I could talk to you for hours. I know, I, I hope that we can talk again soon, because this has been really fun. <laughs> this has, I could talk to you for hours, but you're really busy, and I am always aware of people's time, because Absolutely. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but what if we hook up again? Yeah, sounds good, let's do yeah. it. Okay, great, and I'm going to send you over my Get Witted stuff. Perfect. <laughs> And then, let's just get you set up yep and then we'll just get all set up and then i'll be like look at this so um perfect okay well s-u-p-a-p s-u-p-a-p-a-s-s dot com correct <laughs> and um juliana and the small team so it sounds like you'll get you'll get a quick response and all your questions will be answered. Yeah, we, we, we do a lot with it, with it. We do a lot with a little. A so lot with a little. Fun. I love it. <laughs> Perfect. <It's very> well. <laughs> well, enjoy your evening. It's like now six o'clock there, right? 
Yes, it is. Indeed. Yes. So you probably have to feed that kid. I am indeed going to do that next. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then I'm going to write some board papers. <laughs> and then you're, and then you back at it again. Yeah, exactly. So, well, I yeah. thank you for taking the time to talk to well, me. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. It has. I will um, connect back up with you. One about the Get With It app, and two about um, connecting again. So. Brilliant. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. You have a good yeah. evening there in Norwich. See you soon. Bye. Thanks, bye.